Good morning and welcome to the 15th meeting of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee in 2017. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off mobile phones and any members using electronic devices to access committee papers should ensure that they're switched to silent. Apologies have been received from Jackson Carlaw and I welcome Margaret Mitchell, MSP, as his substitute. Our first item of business today is a decision on taking item three in private. Are members content? For our second item of business today, we will hear from representatives from film location offices and industry experts in a round table evidence session on filmmaking in Scotland. I'd like to welcome the witnesses here today and uh, perhaps we could start by introducing uh, uh, ourselves since this is a round table. I'll work um, anti-clockwise. Uh, my name is Joan McAlpine. I'm convener of the committee and an, I am an MSP for the South of Scotland. Lewis MacDonald. I'm deputy convener and uh, MSP for North East Scotland. I'm Mary Evans and I'm the MSP for Angus North and Mearns. Richard Lockhead, MSP for Murray. Uh, Savage Cross MSP for Shetland, and we've just been filming Shetland in Shetland. <laughs> <laughs> Ross Greer, MSP for the West of Scotland. Stuart McMillan, MSP, MSP for the Greenock and Inverclyde. Margaret Mitchell, MSP, Central Scotland. I'm Rosie Ellison from Film Edinburgh. Uh, Jennifer Reynolds from Glasgow Film Office. I'm Colin Simpson, I cover European Affairs, Tourism and Film with Highland Council. I'm Julie Craig from Five Screen and Tay Screen, serving Fife and Tayside. Good morning, I'm Marie Archer from Aberdeen City and Shire Film Office. Good morning, I'm Alistair Scott I'm from Edinburgh Napier University and part of my role is Director of Screen Academy Scotland, which is our partnership with Edinburgh College of Art. John Archer, run Hop Scotch Films and Chair Independent Producers Scotland. Good morning, I'm Laurit Dunn, I'm a Freelance Location Manager. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to invite Rosie Ellison uh, to make some brief opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much to everybody for inviting us to talk to you this morning. Um, I run Film Edinburgh, which is the film office for Edinburgh, East Lothian and the Scottish Borders. Film Edinburgh is part of Marketing Edinburgh, the Destination Marketing Bureau for the City of Edinburgh Council, and we're also funded by the councils of East Lothian and the Scottish Borders. As a film office, our remit is to promote the region to filmmakers on behalf of the local authority and to facilitate productions filming in the region. At Film Edinburgh, we generally work with about 500 productions a year, ranging from low-impact factual TV programmes like Countryfile, X Factor, party political broadcast filming, um, right through to feature films and TV dramas such as Outlander, T2 Trainspotting, Avengers, Infinity War, and everything in between. Um, since the film office in Edinburgh was established in 1990, and we're the oldest one in Scotland, we've supported over 5,500 productions in the region, and which amounts to over £85 million worth of economic impact. Um, to promote the area, we work with property and landowners in the region who may be interested in having filmmakers use their property. And in our case, we find it increasingly important um, to talk about the value of film tourism as of great interest to, to landowners and property owners. Um, we have information and photos for a huge range of potential filming locations, which we share with filmmakers in response to a brief. This register is continually evolving. We update it daily with changes or new locations which we source through promotion, events and research. In order to facilitate productions, we work with the local authority on policies and procedures that are film friendly, policies which we check against the other film offices in Scotland and around the UK. And these are backed up by a filming charter with the local authority. We're therefore in a good position to be able to advise filmmakers about timescales, processes and costs to film in the region. We also keep a register of local crew and production services so that incoming productions can hire locally and we work with local education establishments on workshops and promote training opportunities to new entrants in the region. At Film Edinburgh we're part of an informal network across Scotland of four film offices, the others being Glasgow, Dundee, which is Five Screen and Tay Screen and the Highlands Film Office. Um, and there are 13 film liaison officers representing the other local authorities or most of the other local authorities around Scotland. 
um, and film liaison officer's role is to support filmmakers in their region, though there is uneven coverage across Scotland due to resources. At the centre of the network sits Creative Scotland's Screen Commission. It's kind of like a wheel, and we're around the outside, and Creative Scotland is in the middle. The Screen Commission is the first port of call for many UK and international productions looking at Scotland as a whole. And they take the lead on proactive marketing and promotion in key markets, such as the US and Europe. The Screen Commission has funds to put towards bringing filmmakers to Scotland, and some of the film offices can complement these with their own recce support. And Creative Scotland Screen Commission also manages Scotland's film funding and incentive programme, which has been very helpful in the last couple of years since it was introduced. Film offices and liaison services collate statistics to, to demonstrate the amount and value of production to the local authorities. We share these with Creative Scotland on a voluntary basis um, in order to help them create the pan Scotland statistics. And in our case, we also use them to benchmark against other parts of the UK, which help us when forming filming policies. Um, in 2016, uh, no, sorry, in 2015, Scotland brought in £52 million worth of of economic spending from production. UK tax incentives are a huge draw for international filmmakers at the moment. And the weak pound is also helping, with upwards of two billion pounds spent in the UK on high value film and TV drama in the UK. The arrival of Netflix and Amazon and film industry style tax breaks for high value TV, which is spending over one million pound per episode, has been a huge boost to the industry. Scotland has managed to attract Outlander which is one of these types of shows, which built its own film studio to house a production and has resulted in more crew being trained at a high level and an increase in facilities basing in Scotland, which together makes Scotland a more attractive place for filmmakers. We'd still need more film studios in Scotland, and indeed we're competing with the rest of the UK, where yet more film studios are being created right now in Wales, Liverpool, London, Manchester and the North East. Any production thinking about basing in Scotland is interested in the whole package, studio and sound stages, incentive finance, tax relief, accessible and varied film-friendly locations and production crew and facilities. Film-friendly local authorities and the cooperation of local agencies and businesses are vital to film and TV production, whether indigenous or inward productions, and as such, film office support goes hand in hand with film studio provision in terms of making Scotland an attractive proposition for filmmakers. Thanks. Thank you very much, Rosie. We are not the first committee of this parliament to, to look into the, the screen sector and the economy committee in the last parliament did quite an extensive um, piece of work on the screen sector where a number of um, uh, important uh, uh, points were made that were taken up by the government in terms of helping to support the film industry in particular in Scotland. But some of the evidence um, from uh, that uh, committee was it's quite relevant in terms of uh, film locations and incentives for attracting film companies to come here. But an issue that was raised um, by a number of um, people involved in production uh, was the whole issue of local hire, that, um, as you outlined, there's uh, 52 million of economic spending that's attracted. But a number of uh, people working in production raised questions about um, the amount of local uh, crews that, that were hired and uh, the benefit uh, to, to locations, even if you did attract out, outside filmmakers. Um, one um, one uh, person who gave evidence, Ben Owens, a scenic artist, pointed to the Canadian example, whereby uh, you're given incentives in return for a 25% or 50% or uh, local hire. Uh, and that was also um, repeated um, by... Bell Doyle, um, who gave evidence uh, to the committee. I just wondered whether, uh, in terms of the roundtable, whether you could you could um, refer to that um, in terms of whether you think more could be done uh, to encourage local hire rather than crews being brought in from elsewhere in the UK. Um, I know that Andrea Calderwood has also raised the issue of, although the tax incentives that you refer to have been very beneficial to the UK as a whole, whether um, they could be regionalised to be a particular benefit uh, to Scotland. So uh, I don't know whether anybody wants to start off on that theme. 
Uh, Julie, Julie, Julie Craig, yeah. yes. Um, I've certainly raised this at things like the TV festival, the idea of, uh, you know, with, with uh, production companies, the idea of having uh, some sort of condition on, on any funding that they get or any help that they get that they must hire, let's say, a percentage of the, their of local services and so on. But the, the uh, most production companies that are inward coming, say, obviously they say that they would resist something like that. I think it's, it would certainly be an interesting matter for discussion by Creative Scotland uh, and also with the tax authorities to see whether there can't be some kind of, um, uh, uh, as part of getting any of these incentives and, and funding support, uh, some kind of uh, um, uh, uh, onus on, the, on productions to use local crew and services. Mm -hmm. So beyond just local, uh, local crew, also different production services because it, uh, there's an organisation called Screen Facilities Scotland and they're repeatedly saying that instead of using the local services that are here, which could be almost anything from transport to camera or whatever, people will insist on using, say, London-based services. Yeah. Because in Canada, my understanding is that, you know, like the Canadians, you know, there's no way you can make a film or a television production in Canada without, uh, without, uh, without using uh, a fair pr proportion of, of local, local crew. John Archer, did you want to come in there? They operate a point system, I think, so that yeah. you, you have to show that you are working with local people. And I think um, one of the things we've discussed at IPS is whether uh, productions that benefit from uh, an incoming production grant shouldn't work with local producers as well, because that's a way of training people up to work on big, big productions. And then that at least leaves some benefit to the local economy and to people's own careers, so they can develop the projects themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and on the other hand, you know, it's, it's a mobile business. Some of our best DOPs go abroad to work for, in Canada yeah. uh, and make their living there. Uh, but the more we have great productions here for them to work on, the more they'll stay at home and develop yes. their careers. Okay. Rosie, did you want to come back Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, Benefiting from the UK tax credit means it is a points-based system as well, and you have to hire local crew, but by local, it's UK. So crew can come from anywhere in the UK. There is further funding within Scotland, the Production Growth Fund, which is also based on how much you spend in, Scot in Scotland, and that is on a, a four-to-one ratio. So again, productions who benefit from that fund, which is managed by Creative Scotland, do have to hire locally whether that's locations or crew or services, and they, they are coming from Scotland. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean they come from the town in which the, the filming is taking place. It can be anywhere in Scotland. Um, the other point is productions have different needs. Um, they might have crew that they are used to working with. Um, uh, um, and not, I think the, the um, film sector review pointed to there being about 800 crew in Scotland, possibly a thousand now. There might be around about that sort of level. You know, we, we may not have enough to, to service every production um, here. So people do bring bring crew up with them. And similarly, as John has pointed out, experienced crew here may want to go and try out Canada or London or um, the US. Um, I think what the work of the film colleges is doing is, um, and universities here are doing is very is, is critical to, to the um, overall package in terms of training um, young people for the industry um, and providing um, opportunities to learn skills and crafts is just as important as um, training people to be directors and producers. Um, following that, following yes. Rosie's point up, um, the partnership that we have between Edinburgh Napier University and Edinburgh College of Art was established in 2005 to create um, Screen Academy Scotland, which delivers practice-led postgraduate courses at a professional level to enable students in tertiary education to get to the highest possible level of training that they can uh, as new entrants going into the industry. Um, that's been very successful over the past 12 years, um, pointing to successes recently, like uh, a recent graduate, Robin Haig, who's based in the northwest of Scotland, whose film Hula won the best short drama at this year's Celtic Media Festival uh, and is, is now um, going the rounds of various festivals. Last year, another one of our uh, postgraduate graduates, Ben Sharrock, um, directed a feature film 
um, called Picadero, which won the Michael Powell Award at the Edinburgh International Film Festival. So showing the level at the top end of, of creative talent being developed um, through Screen Academy Scotland. Uh, but one of the things, one of the issues we face currently is that it was established with um, course enhancement funding, which we have um, benefited from over the 12 years, which has been come from Creative Skill Set, originally the Sector Skills Council for um, the film and screen media. Um, currently, there's a policy change in terms of the, the how that, that's delivered. Um, the um, previous strategy from the British Film Institute has come to an end. In, in December of last year, they announced the, the kind of headline points of their new strategy, which runs from 2017 to 2022. But due to various um, policy delays, that, that the framework of that hasn't um, yet been announced. It's going to be announced at Westminster on the 28th of this, this month. Um, and consequently, there's a kind of vulnerability about some of the funding that we have that helps us in our program of professional development for students and in the various ways in which students can engage with the industry in Scotland. And preserving that uh, and having sustainable um, support for those industry education links is, I think, absolutely vital in terms of a future strategy for sustainable film in Scotland. Okay, thanks very much. I'm going to bring in Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm keen to explore a little about how central and local government supports uh, your work and, 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 and the film sector in, in general, having heard from John on the previous committee's uh, uh, evidence sessions. I know things have moved on, but uh, in relation to Creative Scotland, uh, our advisors uh, tell us that uh, their guide film in Scotland indicates where there's film uh, studio space available, but doesn't actually provide contact details for the regional film offices. That surprised me quite, quite a bit. And I was curious to know if that was symptomatic of a wider problem or simply a, a blip in, in, in somebody's preparation of a, of a website. Marie. Um, on Creative Scotland's website, all the film location networks are listed through there. Um, so that may be an anomaly, but the working relationship between certainly the film liaison and the film offices is very strong, as is the referral scheme that links with them. Um, certainly from my local authority as a film liaison, without the support of Creative Scotland, there would be no way that, A, that I was trained to be a film commissioner, and see the support and the understanding of the local authority and the connections and the wider opportunities that brings to our region are highly supported by that. In the last five years, we've had an increase in production that has been life-changing for our communities. Um, for example, this afternoon, I'll go back to Aberdeen where we have a course of 40 young people on introduction to hit the ground running, which is the entry-level runners courses. Um, my communities have seen opportunities to have feature films filmed in their local towns. I've had a young person who's come back to film in his hometown as part of a crew, a professional crew. Um, we've had young people who've told us it's been life-changing. Um, where we understand that the creative economy has a huge power within Scotland, in some of our regions that creative economy is only lightly touching our regions. In the northeast of Scotland, film has changed that for us. But we need further support and investment to maintain that in a time when local authorities are having to make some strong choices. And is that a general view? Is it a robust and, and productive relationship for, 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 I would for, certainly for agree across from the board? From yes. point of view, we measure where our inquiries come from, and I would say over a quarter of our inquiries actually get directed to us through Creative Scotland, so there's definitely good day-to-day -day working relationship. And as an industry professional, there is no job I do that does not have a direct line to Creative Scotland. The amount of support they provide every production is hugely beneficial. I mean, they are the spine in a way. I, I actually view Creative Scotland as my colleagues. So regardless of which production I'm working on with however many people, the fact that there's a direct line to Creative Scotland and they act actively benefit everything uh, from my location's perspective, is hugely rewarding. They're interested, they're informative, they're up to date, and they provide valuable assistance where needed. 
Uh, that's very encouraging. Can, can I follow up a point Rosie Ellison mentioned, and I, I think probably relevant particularly to Marie and, and, and perhaps to Julie, since they're both in neighbouring regions. I think you described it as a network of four film offices, Glasgow, Edinburgh, Highland, and Fife and Tayside, and then a different concentric circle of other local authorities. Can, can you explain the difference between, for example, how you work in Fife and Tayside and, and how you work in, in Grampian? Well, I, I suppose the, the idea of a dedicated screen office um, is, is different to uh, in, in the, the wider Scottish Locations Network, and there's a website, scottishlocationsnetwork.com, which actually directs towards Creator Scotland to the very page that has us all listed. Uh, but the, uh, the people who have sort of screen liaison duties, um, they will be part of a wider remit. They'll be, generally speaking, in economic development or possibly a culture department. Mostly, we find economic development, and they will have wider duties concerning perhaps tourism, um, ec uh, uh, di different kinds of business development, inward investment, that kind of thing. So that the time that they have in offices that are not dedicated to this work um, is, is, is less. It doesn't mean to say that they, that, that they don't provide a really valuable service, it's an absolutely crucial service to have coverage across Scotland. Uh, but the difference being that with a, a dedicated screen office, we are, we are encouraged, and certainly the, the councils of Angus, Dundee, Fife and Perth and Kimross are strongly encouraging of not, not just the idea of keeping a locations database and image bank and so on, but also of, of identifying all the local businesses that can, can benefit from screen production, of bringing together lo location owners and business owners to understand the business and, and, uh, and engage with it. So I think you wanted to compare with Marie. In Aberdeen City and Shire, we work across the two local authorities. I'm um, partially funded by our cultural services department and a small amount of money from our economic development department to cover two days of my time to focus on film. So that's direct liaison where we have productions contacting us, but also to build databases and information for productions and crew within the region. Um, additionally, since we've had an increase in production in the last five years, we've also had a tourism product that relates to screen, which then has added on to the workload of my liaison role. So um, each local authority will have a different set of skill sets behind their liaison officer. Some will have production understanding, some will be purely planners, marketing people, tourism. And my comment earlier about Creative Scotland, five years ago, Creative Scotland made a leap of faith and train some of the film liaison officers for the first time. And that changed my ability to do my job and to understand what the needs of a production was coming. I jokingly say that when a production comes in, it's like watching a small army take over your community, except in a good way that can change a community becoming part of that army to make something really special. And that role is unique. In the local authority, it requires a huge trust on an officer who may or no, may not be trained to do it yet you're asking everything from the roads to close to your young people to being licensed to be in the film through to communities landscape changing. Um, and that requires a confidence of the local authority and a confidence of the production company in their liaison officer to be able to pull it off with them. And so that role is quite a difficult role when it's one person rather than the full screen commission. I happened to be in Macduff the day that happened uh, recently, so I know, I know what you mean. Uh, but, but it sounds to me as if you are as much a full-time uh, person focused on this role as your colleague. No, it's two days a week okay. as a film officer all, and three do, days correct. a week as an arts development officer within my local authority. And obviously I try and balance the two to the best of my sides of my posts. Thanks very much. Okay. Margaret Mitchell. Just before I go on to my main question, to pick up on something Julia said about Creative Scotland Location National Film Commission and Film in Scotland, the directory, which was aimed to, to point um, filmmakers at what's happening with the network of local offices, it does say that although studio space is available in Scotland, the guide does not provide a list or direct contact details on the regional film offices. Um, so that seems quite quite a gap. And just talking about my local area, I had no idea, despite being in politics and an elected member at various levels from local government right up, that there was a Lanarkshire screen uh, location office, uh, office there. So does it need more awareness raising? 
and also to move on to my next point, you can maybe tackle them together. There seems to be a, a, now at crossroads a divide which way we're going. Are we going to more centralise Central uh, Creative Scotland role and have it as an overview, sort of deciding where things go, which it could be looked at? Or are we going to look at the local location offices um, as a gateway, beef them up a bit, give them more funding? Um, encourage them to, to look at match funding so that they can do the kind of things that I think Dr Scott was talking about. Because I know in my local area, Coatbridge College is doing amazing work in uh, cosmetic, if it's called it, or artistic or dramatic um, makeup, um, media study, all of these things, it seems, in education, in beefing up the local economy, there are real opportunities. So which way should we be looking, or is it a balance? Um, if I can say from, from a Highland perspective, I think to an extent we've probably got the balance about right and we prefer not to see it go too much one way or the other. Yeah. I think there's a need for the, the centralised resource because when we're trying to do things at a larger scale or whether we're going outside Scotland and trying to attract attention, people don't re necessarily recognise the different parts of Scotland. They do recognise Scotland as a whole. On the other hand, when it comes down to a specific inquiry and they're saying what's that road like or who's the owner of that property, that's where your local knowledge that the local film offices have comes in. So there, I think there needs to be a bit of both and I think personally anyway, I think there'd be a bit of a concern if we centralised more but equally there may be risks in going the other way. Yeah. I think it is about um, investing so you have a Scotland-wide network of film liaison at the very minimum that is trained and supports Creative Scotland in the increase of film that we have had. Their role is unique for us all as our film offices. I couldn't promote my region to the scale that we can if we collectively promote together through Creative Scotland. Can, can I ask, is that because of funding or because the, it isn't beefed up to that extent to cope with it? But could it be? I, I mean the, the local, the local one, rather than just saying we don't have the resources, we know there's pressure on budgets, but say we were to make, wave a magic wand, just for example, the funding could be made available. Would that be the way to go? Would there be any disadvantages in that or could there be real opportunities? I think from my local authority, because of the scale of filming that has happened in the last five years, having the ability to put more time into our film office, to actually proactively market it, to work with Visit Scotland as a partner, our regional visit and tourism partners, to be able to tell those film tourism stories. You could see an economic benefit come from that investment, so there is an argument for that. Um, I'd just like to say, I think um, Creative Scotland has a, a different role to the local authorities. Um, Creative Scotland is, is very much a, a kind of central pool, and they, they are um, out there in the world selling Scotland as a whole. Um, we, as local authority services, look inwards, <laughs> if you like. Um, I spend an awful lot of time with, with um, various um, council officers and councillors, um, convincing them that film and television are um, of benefit to the region, whether that be through the tourism impact or the economic impact or the educational impact, giving people um, opportunities for jobs um, and, uh, and training. Um, and I, I don't think it's a value to, to, uh, for a local authority to suddenly go, right, we are going to go out on our own and, and promote our local authority region when that can be done as a central resource and is being done very well, very, very well indeed by Creative Scotland who go out to United States. Um, they've been to Korea, I think. <laughs> they go to Europe fairly regularly and sell Scotland as a whole, which, which helps people come and look at Scotland and see that we have this huge range of locations. The other thing to point is, out is that each local authority doesn't have a huge range of locations. I mean, I can't offer in, in Edinburgh and the Scottish borders and East Lothian, I can't offer jiggity jaggedy mountains as you've got <laughs> in the Highlands. We just don't have them. Um, but I'm very happy to refer um, people to the Highlands Film Office and, and, um, and to Julie for um, some of the central Perthshire mountains uh, if they're looking for that kind of thing. But, you know, having this central resource in Creative Scotland is absolutely invaluable. But I think we work well. We could work better. There's there's no doubt about it. If there were, um, if every local authority had uh, some kind of representation, because I don't think it, it's the whole of Scotland that's covered at the moment. Um, and well, um, 
the, the panel here today is very focused on what we do. There are other film liaison officers who, who really don't even have a day to spend on film. Um, you know, that, so there could be, there is a call for more even coverage to make sure that when um, Creative Scotland is out looking for responses and, and information about filming all over Scotland, that they get responses from all over Scotland, so that there is a, um, an even collation of statistics around Scotland, so that when filmmakers go to shoot um, in the more remote areas of Scotland, there's somebody in the council who can answer the phone um, rather than having to wait for uh, a Wednesday in a week's time or something like that. Uh, yeah, I just want to emphasise what Rosie's saying, that I would say that one of the greatest parts of our job in Glasgow Film Office is having that relationship with other departments in the council to emphasise um, what filming can bring to the, to the city and build those relationships so they understand that when Creative Scotland have attracted a production to Scotland that we are able to follow up on, on the, um, what's been told to them, what can happen in a city or a region, that we, we can put them in touch with the right people to make the things happen. Okay. Thank you very much. It's a bit worrying you still have to persuade councillors that the film's of value to the local economy. Uh, maybe we'll come back to that later. Um, I should say, just to put it on the record, that prior to being elected to Parliament in 1999, I worked in the Inward Investment section of the Economic Development Part Department of Dundee City Council and proposed that we set up Film Dundee, so it's good to see that uh, Tay Skeen are, are here today, which no doubt uh, emerged out, hopefully, of Film Dundee and <laughs> <laughs> uh, that fantastic initiative. Uh, my couple of questions goes back to Rosie Ellison's opening remarks, if I picked her up correctly, which is that the spend in Scotland in 2015, I think you said, was £50 million or thereabouts. Whereas in the UK it was two billion. Uh, my quick calculation, but someone will correct me if I'm wrong, is that's about two and a half percent of expenditure is in Scotland. So that's not good enough, really. And I would like to know the panel's views on why do we have such a little share of the UK's expenditure in film? What support do we get from the private sector? Be that whisky companies are commissioning very expensive adverts and hire advertising agencies, hopefully Scottish ones, but no doubt often London ones, who then hire filmmakers in London, presumably. I don't know the, the detail, but I just wonder if that is a trend. Uh, and also, <clears throat> how are we proactively selling Scotland overseas? A lot of the discussion today will be about what we can offer when film producers and, and companies come to Scotland. But how are we getting Scotland onto the radar screen of the, the industries in other countries around the world so they actually think about Scotland in the first place? If I could just say, I, I don't believe that the, the two billion is spent entirely on, let's say, location production. Correct me if I'm wrong. I, I think a, a, there is a significant amount of that money spent on uh, the, the kind of bricks and mortar services, the post-production, visual effects, animation virtual reality, augmented reality, and, and all, other, all of these other technologies that are coming along. And perhaps it's an appropriate moment to mention that, uh, you, you might, uh, uh, Mar Margaret Mitchell, uh, uh, forgive me if I've got the protocol wrong, but you mentioned about funding. Um, we've been in a position that, that our, the, the councils that I work for have supported um, applying for external funding. And I'll come on to the point about post-production just immediately. Um, we were originally funded with ERDF money, the kind of the, the sort of local regional ERDF money. When we couldn't get that anymore, we moved on to interreg European Union money. Um, uh, and we had an, an original project called North Sea Screen Partners. We've now done a new project called Create Converge. And it, it uh, really is, it concerns the need for um, a strategy and a policy for development of the, of the sectors for post-production, animation, visual effects virtual reality and all of those things which are firing headlong down in the south of England, but we're really not having development of those industries to a sufficient, at sufficient speed here in Scotland in order to attract that kind of um, inward investment and spend. And I think that, uh, the, I mean, I'll leave the studio side out of it because that's been long and well debated. Um, but it, I think it would be helpful if there were a strategy and a policy for development of those sectors in Scotland. And it's certainly something that as a transnational project with nine partners in five countries, we're, we're very much trying to uh, do our best to inform that policy. Um, I could just like to say about the, the two billion plus, um, the majority of that is spent in studio productions. 
um, the majority of which are uh, housed down south. Um, there are loads of film studios around London, each with many, many stages. Um, Wales has now got about three, four complexes, each with several stages. Um, this is where the money is being spent. In Scotland, we have Ward Park Studio, which is brilliant. Thank goodness we have this. And other than that, we have various sheds, which get converted for um, a, a short period of time while the film uses it, and then they're set back to normal. And if an engineering firm wants to move in and take on the 10-year lease, then it's off the market. Park is not available to the wider film community. It is only Outlander Studio. Yeah. And even when they are on downtime, it cannot be rented. Therefore, it doesn't enter our sphere of studio space at all. That's right. Um, so that's one of the reasons we haven't been able to get more of the, the £2 billion that is available out there. Um, we haven't got the studio infrastructure and increasingly um, we, we are seeing these kind of high value productions coming in and we, we had a 35% increase in inquiries from high value TV and feature films in the last year, um, all of which are looking for studio space. Um, and while they might come up here, as the Avengers did, and use our locations, um, which is fantastic, we're very, very happy to have them here, and, and for us to be able to then sell Scotland off the back of that, um, they spend a lot more money when they choose to base here and could spend, as Outlander does, nine months of the year filming, um, creating jobs um, for people, um, creating training opportunities for young people. Um, and it's, I don't think we're just calling for one studio. I mean, what we have in Scotland is one studio with Outlander filling every stage going there. What we need is, uh, and what exists down south, and the reason they're bringing in so much money is that there are a range of studios um, in different places to facilitate different kinds of productions, different sizes. Um, uh, around Atlanta in Georgia, um, there are, I think it was 18 different studio complexes that are, are all around the city. They've created a film academy um, uh, that, that, that trains crew to um, keep people local and, um, and to service the productions that come in. I mean, that's another thing that's come up when talking about studio here. We could create all the studios in the world, but we, we will also need to drive crew to, um, to, to work here and live here. But this is one of the issues that we've had in Scotland with a kind of feast and famine industry where we have a splurge of production and then suddenly it, go, it's, it goes quiet and the crew leave. Um, it's difficult for people to sustain a career and this is something that was in the, the film sector review report from 2014. Um, people have, there are a few like Laurette who have decided to stay and let's hope she stays. <laughs> fantastic track record but many do leave and go to London or elsewhere um, because the work hasn't been there. Um, the hope is that if we can create studios and we have the, 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 the continuance continuance of the UK tax credit or similar um, plus incentive finance to cause productions to look at Scotland we can attract productions to stay here um, and to shoot over many, many months, hopefully many years, giving careers and opportunities to, um, to, to people who want to live here. I think the basics is when a production comes over here, an international production will come over, and when they come, they are looking for everything, as Rosie says. They want a studio, but they also want their locations. The benefit of a studio is it provides weather cover and it also gives you flexibility. For example, you might build the inside of a castle in a studio rather than try and do it in one of Historic Environment Scotland's properties. What happens more and more is that productions will come over and they will only come for the key locations they need because the studio does not exist. So instead of us getting an entire production which will automatically result in employment locally and across the whole country, we get this small amount, people will bring in their entire crew because their production base is elsewhere where the studio exists. So we don't see that in our reports, we don't see the same amount of spend coming through. And that's why people go, gosh, I didn't even realise such and such a production we're in, because they move quickly, they shoot a location, and they take the entire crew and their own location in another country. So with the studio, we will be able to provide so much more in the way of jobs and benefit our economy dramatically. Certainly, uh, certainly one of the <coughs> excuse me, problems is a continuity and consistency of funding. Um, 
one of the ways in which Screen Academy Scotland ha has engaged with the industry in addition to um, our degree programs was through a project which was called Screen Nets, which was funded through Creative Scotland with the, the Film Skills Fund that w was, was um, uh, made available by Scottish Government in, in 2016. Um, announced in, in the autumn of 2015. Um, this project's been very successful in terms of finding and developing young trainees uh, and uh, engaging those trainees with the high-end um, television pro productions that have come to the country, but also with the, the feature films that were made here last year. That's a great way for developing trainees and giving them the skills that are needed for the incoming productions However, that was, that was a one-off that was just for, for that year. And the lack of continuity is, is a real problem if you're trying to build a sustainable industry, if you're trying to um, get young people who are, are training or educated in, in the skills necessary for the industry, if you're going to allow them to, to believe that they can have careers that are based here, rather than have to look elsewhere and have to move south in, inevitably because there's this fracturing of, of jobs available. Um, so finding a way of having a strategy that can make things more consistent is, I think, absolutely vital. Thanks very much. Ross Greer. Yeah, thanks, Convener. Just uh, going back to the Convener's original question, the evidence that Ben Owens had given to the previous committee in session four, um, this has been touched on slightly, I think, in answer to Lewis McDonald, but one of the things he mentioned was uh, for those working in the sector, particularly self-employed people, to find employment. The example used in Canada was of the uh, provincial film commissions having uh, live production lists on their website with uh, dates of production, with full contact details for folk to get in touch directly, and that was boosting employment, making it easier for people to get in, and he recommended that for Scotland. Has that been developed since he gave that evidence in session four? Most productions don't want us to do that as a starting point. Um, we would be in breach of confidentiality if, if we put details, such as those kind of details, on websites. Um, productions reach a certain point when they do want to start crewing up, and at that point um, they will speak to um, those of us who have got lists of, of local crew and ask us to... to Put, either put the message out to them for them to send in CVs and get in touch, or um, we send the production company their CVs and put them in touch that way around. Um, but in terms of a, an online production li list of forthcoming productions, it doesn't happen at all. Could, can I ask just on that point, because the point you raised about confidentiality was my first assumption when I read this, but I couldn't think of why British Columbia and Ontario would be so radically different to hear for... Why, why is that working for them? Why is, why is it being cited as, as a useful example, but it wouldn't work here? Because I had the same thought as you about mm. confidentiality. If I can add from our point of view, confidentiality is certainly one issue. I think the, the other side that we see from some of the production companies is that where they're in a relatively remote area, it might be okay. They could sort of make it a bit clearer what they're doing and where. When you get to some of the more populated areas, I think there's a concern that, particularly for better-known productions, You'll get lots of people out to watch it. It will start mm. interrupting them actually undertaking the filming. So I think they're kind of cautious about making things too public in that sense. So going through likes of ourselves direct to the crew rather than putting it out too publicly seems to suit them better. I think it just might be worth just highlighting um, Film Bang for sort of production services and things in Scotland as well. Um, because obviously external productions get that shared with them as a website, but also were given the actual paper directories when they come into the country. And just from my perspective, when we talk about crew, it could be as specific as having the TV aerial man locally uh, hired rather than brought in um, to remove all the aerials for whiskey galore and put them back up every night. So, you know, when we say crew, I think we need to think about the professional film crew, but also the crew that is used on the grounds within those communities. And that does come down to local knowledge and who's the best and who's going to turn up on the job on time. Thank you. Thanks very much. Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Convener. Um, the issue of the, the film studios, um, 
Uh, obviously, a few examples have been provided uh, thus far, and also there, there has been the situation uh, in Scotland. But surely film studios are uh, owned uh, predominantly, uh, if not solely, by uh, private businesses as compared to the state. Is that not the case in elsewhere as well? Yes. Hmm. Countries in Europe that we deal with through our European projects, they, uh, places like Aarhus, for example, uh, in Denmark, central Denmark, they, they saw it as a, a, real, um, a real help to, to create a publicly funded studio. Uh, and although it's not the most, uh, you know, the, not the most glamorous of studios, but it's certainly a fully functioning, very large studio. And they found that's helped them bring in quite a lot of the uh, sort of scandic uh, noir uh, productions that have been going. Um, I, th I think it's where there might be a market failure. One of the challenges for studios is finding a, a studio operator. Uh, really, there's, there's not that many studio operators, and increasingly, um, Pinewood as a business <coughs> is tending to want to do more of a kind of what they call a dry hire than a wet hire situation, which means that they will basically allow uh, or have a, do a deal with companies like Disney to take over some of the stages um, on a sort of full maintenance basis, bringing in all their own crew and so on, um, that they're really only responsible for keeping the place wind and watertight, uh, as opposed to in the, in the old days where these studios would have, um, you know, perhaps several hundred of their own staff um, to support productions. Um, so, uh, the, the, as I said, it comes back to this thing of the challenge of finding enough uh, of the appropriate operators to run studios and, and also operators, in, uh, typically Pinewood, would want quite a significant um, share of profits, for example, uh, and quite a large fee uh, in order to run studios, let's say, in Scotland. That, that's an element that might need perhaps uh, initially some kind of government support. The reason I pose the question is because I've heard this morning and also heard before in this committee uh, of the shortage of studio uh, capacity uh, in Scotland. But uh, obviously, uh, if that studio capacity isn't there, but if, the, well, if it's the operators or the, or, or the film uh, companies themselves, if they don't actually want to invest uh, in actually building a film studio uh, in, in Scotland, then um, is the argument that's coming from yourselves, is the argument that the state should then uh, go and fund uh, studios in different locations within Scotland? Um, we know that there are, there's at least, well, there's the Pentland Studio on the table, which is mm. an entirely private sector mm. in, um, project. Um, and uh, here in the Edinburgh City region, we are very grateful that um, the government gave it green light for planning permission in principle recently. Let's hope it goes through all the way. Um, there are other proposals out there and um, people working together to try to get studios off the ground. Um, from our point of view, the more the merrier, really. Um, then we'll just need <coughs> more crew to, to facilitate the productions here, and that may take a, a long time. As I understand it, um, this is one of the difficulties when, when the private sector are looking to take on a, um, a studio project. There's a, there's, a, there's a high level of risk, obviously. Um, and without us having a, a, you know, a much larger crew base to, um, to service productions <coughs> coming here, um, it, it makes it a, a, you know, well, that's part of the risk element of, of a, a studio development. Um, one of the things that works for other studios around the country and around the world is, is um, a studio complex that has other rent-paying, rates-paying tenants around the side who can carry on paying the rent even if the studio is to stand empty for a few months. Um, and that's certainly that's something that the Pentlands proposal has got within it. Um, there may be others that are built on that model. Certainly Bristol has that, Liverpool has that, Manchester has that. Um, I don't know about the Pinewood ones, I'm not an expert in those. Um. Well, I think it could make a big difference is what you touched on right at the beginning, is having extra fiscal incentives in Scotland. And uh, through the Screen Leadership Group report, there was a mention of the idea of VAT on cinema tickets being put into a film fund. Uh, the reality is that any extra funding that can come to a production makes it very attractive to people looking where they're going to film around the world. And if Scotland had that, then it would be much more practical, much more realistic for someone to want to invest in a studio in Scotland, because then people would be accessing an extra fund. So anything that can be done to add to the film funding would be terrific. Mm -hmm. and 
I, I mean, I think uh, Scotland as a whole has been underdeveloped in its production businesses for a very long time. And at the moment, we've got the prospect of the new BBC Scotland channel, which is the first bit of optimism we've had for a long time. And um, I think from the Screen Leadership Group report, one of the things that I'd really like to see government taking on board is the BBC are now putting up an extra 40 million into Scotland every year, 20 million for the channel, 20 million for network production. Uh, and the suggestion alongside that is the doubling of the funding for Creative Scotland and their film unit. And that would bring us up to about the same level as Northern Ireland gets for their production. And that, to me, is the big issue for government to be tackling in this area. If you could get that right, that would be a tremendous boost. And if we miss the opportunity of this BBC Scotland channel, which many in the rest of the BBC will be willing to fail, they don't like the fact that money is coming to Scotland. They want to see it collapse, uh, whereas the rest of us want to see it as something which is going to grow. Then my um, plea to you is to actually see in the letters you've written to Creative Scotland and the Scottish Enterprise, you have told them they need to work together. It's long overdue. And what can Scottish Enterprise do for, for the screen businesses in Scotland to take advantage of the new channel? Uh, that kind of growth is the important growth, I think, to see. And um, if I can just give an example of one company that has um, grown over the past 20 years, what I think is a sort of perfect way, Sigma Films, Gillian Berry and David McKenzie, started off making shorts, uh, paid for probably mostly by um, Scottish Screen, shorts like California Sunshine, they made a low budget feature, The Last Great Wilderness, then David made uh, Young Adam and uh, Starred Up, Films gradually growing in scale. He made his first Hollywood feature, um, Helen High Water. And now in Scotland, he is developing a 70 million Netflix production, um, which um, is the kind of thing we'd love to see attracted into Scotland, but this has been grown from within. It's a story of um, Robert the Bruce, the outlaw king, and that should be a huge boost to the economy. We need more Sigmas. We need more companies capable of developing those projects. But they can't do it on thin air. They need support. Okay. I think I you've touched on an important point there. And I think Julie had mentioned earlier about support for, for um, uh, post-production as well. The, the impression I'm getting from the evidence that we received here reflects uh, evidence that I hear from speaking to people in the industry and also from the cross-party group on culture that I convene is that actually Creative Scotland is getting it right now. Um, but there's still a big question mark over um, what um, the enterprise agency, Scottish Enterprise, is doing. Would you say that was reasonable? Uh, yes. I think that uh, it's very clear in the report what needs to happen. The film unit, which has been proposed for Creative Scotland, needs to be given the chance to grow. But it can't... When Scottish Screen was set up, all the ambition was there 20-odd years ago, but there wasn't the funding. It couldn't be done. This is an opportunity to take, to put the funding into it. If you can't make it work off the back of the, the BBC's investment, which has been the investment that's been denied us for so many years, then we never will. Can I just come back yes. The, Port angle, and I think if we maybe move away from film for a moment, just to, as an example, in the area I'm from in, around Inverness, there's been some investment in the life science sector, but that was only kick-started by there being some public investment, and that's then starting to give this kind of cluster effect. And I think, in a sense, what we're looking at here is saying the industry might not jump in and take the risk themselves, but if the public sector supports that initial phase, then the industry will come in and the cluster effect will see it grow and take over itself. So it's maybe just that kickstart that it's needing rather than necessarily that something has to be publicly run well into the future. Uh, Richard Lockhead, did you want to come back in? Uh, yes, to say I'm really excited by the idea of a Netflix series on Robert the Bruce, played by Chris Pine. <laughs> Although I would have been available myself at, you know, <laughs> asked. <coughs> For Robert the Bruce, of course. Uh, you mentioned, uh, John Archer, in terms of the public agencies working together, and I wanted to ask Lorette Dunn a question about that in terms of the Team Scotland approach to making Scotland's locations and facilities available to productions. So there's a, there's a case in my constituency which I'm 
kind of trying to pursue, where we've got a former RAF base, RAF can loss, which is a massive site, largely unused by the army that moved in. Therefore, we've got all this spare infrastructure and capacity. And many people have told me that'd be an ideal location for film work. You know, empty hangars, lots of space, etc., and on the border of the Highlands. So, do you feel there is a Team Scotland approach? Because when I raised that with the MOD, they didn't object to the idea, but they weren't exactly full of enthusiasm, and they were more inclined to think of the problems as opposed to the opportunities. So, I just wondered whether you felt there was a Team Scotland approach to making it easy for filming to happen in Scotland. It's an interesting question. Uh, some days I would have said yes, and other days I say no. It depends on which direction I find myself travelling. Uh, if we're talking about the MOD, I have to say I've filmed with them fairly extensively in the last few years, and I find that even in that period of time, they've become very much more focused on bringing in new business, and that includes filmmakers. So doors which were once firmly closed have started to open there. Um, it is interesting. Every production differs, as you can imagine, from every other one. Um, I find when I work within, you know, as I always do within the country, although Creative Scotland, as I was saying earlier, are a key factor to me, all the regional offices are incredibly important as well. So knowing that wherever in Scotland I am aiming for, there is somebody there to help facilitate that and who also has experience, and that I think is the key, it's the experience. And that experience for, helps the doors open, but also there's an underlying current the whole time of the fact that these regional offices are moving forwards, that almost every day they are opening the eyes to another new business or another new landowner, that filming is a possibility and it is a, a bringer of investment, however short term. So I see it as positive. I think Team Scotland, I would probably say yes. I think that there is a strong feeling of let's make this happen, you know, filmmaking, TV making, whatever level we're on, it brings jobs and it brings good things. Stuart McMillan, I think you wanted to come back in. Uh, yeah, it was a separate question on a different area, if that's okay. Okay. Yeah. Right? okay. Yeah. Um, thank you, uh, Kimbira. Um, I accept that the, the film uh, industry is a, it's a global industry uh, and uh, various factors and various elements will, will come into play uh, on a regular basis. Uh, in terms of uh, political change uh, that, uh, that happens, and also the, the question, certainly within Scotland and the UK, regarding the European Union position, uh, and some EU funding has been touched upon earlier on, um, have any of you had any discussions with, uh, with the public bodies regarding uh, the potential outcome uh, post the, the UK uh, leaving the European Union? And how do you think it would actually affect what you're trying to do uh, in Scotland? That, but that's largely because I have a European role within Highland Council as well as the film one. Uh, I think, in short, we see there will be some impact on any form of business, partly due to uncertainty, partly due to potential changes in access to markets, and that might affect things like collaborative projects. But I think it's fair to say that we haven't honed in specifically on the film industry and looked at whether there'll be any impacts there that won't apply to other sectors. As, as, uh, as an office that's benefited significantly from European funding, uh, obviously it is a con concern going forward as to what, uh, what, if anything, will replace that opportunity. We're not saying replace that funding, but replace the opportunity. Uh, because I mean, currently we're we're able we're in a position to be able to coordinate and assemble projects that apply to um, uh, schemes such as Horizon 2020, um, to uh, various other you know to European Union the creative the creative fund that they operate, um, uh, as well as to various interregs. But uh, as, uh, unless we get, uh, I suppose, some kind of Norwegian type deal in the future. Um, I don't know what people feel about a Norwegian-type deal, but um, if it was something like that, that would enable us still to apply for funding. But even when Norway is involved in projects, they're, they're not able to access, to my understanding, the central uh, EU money. They've got to, in effect, match it with their own government money. Um, it's just that they're part of the same, uh, the same scheme, if you like. So I think it is a concern, but I, 
I'm afraid I don't have answers uh, as to what the future might look like. Uh, yeah. Creative Europe is another place to go to, to get funding, development funding um, and production funding. And uh, our most successful production in that it's sold to 30 countries around the world is a story of film. And the initial funding for that was a development grant from the media programme, which is now Creative Europe. Whether that money remains for screen production and screen development is the question that producers have, because obviously the money comes from us <laughs> to begin with. So if uh, we're no longer part of Creative Europe, will that money come to Creative Scotland? Will it go to the BFI, or will it just be siphoned off elsewhere? Um, only about 4% of the inquiries and the productions that we get in, in the region are, uh, are drama, high-value dramas. The rest of it is um, documentaries and corporates and uh, light entertainment and so on. And these come in from all over, from Scotland, from UK, from, from Europe, the States, all over the place. Um, and, and it's that... Um, kind of production which which may be affected by Brexit. I mean, if there are increasing tariffs to get here, then, then that, that might have an impact. Um, as for the American productions coming in, well, they would pay tariffs anyway at the moment. Um, and the weak pound is making the UK an attractive place to come at the moment. Um, I have a, a, a colleague in the film office in Kent who has reported something that's come up from Brexit in that they had um, a long-running Netflix series that, that operated both in Kent and uh, across in France, and they lost it due to the, the risks of Brexit. Um, but we haven't here experienced any loss yet um, as a result of the, possible, the, the future. Um, so it is still hard to say how exactly it will play out. Yes? Yeah, it was just in terms of some of the, the transnational funding, though, that you talked about. I mean, you talked about Interreg, and I was just wondering for some of the other bodies as well how, how big a feature that's played um, in, in your operations and if, you'd ex if that will be a big hit for you. <laughs> no. Glasgow Film Office was a European funded project from 1999 to 2008. Um, then with the increase of the European Union around the same time, they, the, the funding ended. And since that point, our staff has been reduced from six to two. And we're now fully funded by Glasgow City Council. Okay. We don't have any direct funding in Highland that goes into the film office. But on the other hand, I think there are impacts, in a, in a sense, in a secondary sense. So uh, we rely on some infrastructure for productions that have perhaps has perhaps been funded by European money in the past. So there, even if not direct to the film office, I think there's still an impact from the funding side. Some possible um, productions have had money through the LEADER programme, but that's mm -hmm. the only connection at the moment. One of our um, postgraduate taught master's programmes is a partnership with uh, a university in Portugal and a university in Estonia and is funded through the Erasmus scheme. So um, clearly how, how that is impacted will, will have an impact on, on one of the programmes. Um, Does anyone else want to come in on that point? funding that we get beyond the original ERDF, um, it's not really been um, absolutely directly and solely for the functions mm -hmm. of the screen office. We've had to, if you like, explore other opportunities in order to attract that kind of funding. But that, that obviously the quid pro quo is we have to deliver on those projects. And while we willingly do that, obviously that does take time away from your sole focus on being a screen office. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, we're just about to wind up now, but um, if there are any other issues that you would, we have a little bit of time in hand, if there are any other issues that haven't been raised with you that you think are important to your sector, um, we have a few moments in hand that you can raise them. Just to maybe highlight uh, the connection of the film tourism side, um, Jenny Steele in Visit Scotland has been doing an amazing job promoting the products that we've had here in Scotland. But as that increases, that's going to be an increasing challenge for Scotland of how to use that resource. And when that resource goes out to market, that's another way of marketing 
our country has opened for film. Um, and you had raised um, whether film could be included in Scotland 2020 as part of that. Um, that was just it. I think it was Rosie who had mentioned in our discussions that she had not found a film particularly mentioned in the Scotland 2020 strategy. I'm, I'm not an expert on Scotland no. 2020. No, no. But, <laughs> but I think, well, um, I, and certainly having tried to identify that myself, it didn't seem to be the case. So. Sorry. I, I was just going to add on the, on the tourism side, certainly in areas like the Highland, being featured in films has been a key driver of bringing visitors to the area. Uh, but that, that in, in a sense, then has potentially a negative impact on future filming. Some of the areas that have been really popular, like the Isle of Skye, we're now getting to the stage that film companies are interested in coming filming something else in Sky, but Sky's so popular with the visitors that they can't get the accommodation for crew and so on while they're there. So in a way, these things are... It's a nice problem to have. We'd rather be busy than not busy, but they can put pressure on infrastructure, and I think that's probably quite typical of certainly all rural areas, but equally, I guess, it's probably an issue on a seasonal basis in our cities and so on as well. Yeah. Well, actually, we had a roundtable with the tourism industry last week, and that was one of the issues that came up, um, particularly in, in Glasgow and Edinburgh, and we were told that there was a a big international conference in Glasgow uh, that Glasgow lost because they just didn't have enough high-end hotel accommodation. So it's interesting if it's affecting your sector as well. Recently, um, we've been making this film, out, Outlaw King, that uh, John had mentioned. And there was an area in Scotland um, that we were particularly interested in filming in, but we are not going there because we cannot put the co find accommodation for the crew Right, where is it? <laughs> <laughs> it's actually, I'm sorry, it's in Aberdeenshire. Yeah. The, the, the one benefit of um, the oil downturn is actually we actually have spare hotel rooms, mm -hmm. but we struggle to get crew in. Yeah. Um, it took every agency that we could to house the crew for Whiskey Galore and for Stonemouth. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a future production that may be on the cards. So I worry where we're going to house them. Yeah. OK, thank you very much for coming to give our, your evidence today. Part of this process is um, for the committee to uh, engage widely with the sectors uh, that in our remit so that we can discuss our work programme uh, going forward. So if there are issues that are raised today, we can then kind of drill down later on uh, in the next uh, session uh, uh, to perhaps um, focus on particular issues affecting screen. So if there's anything that you would like to follow up on, you're very welcome to submit um, written evidence to us um, after today's session. Thank you very much. We're now going into private.